Welcome to episode 176 of Real Health Radio. You can find the links talked about as part of this episode at the show notes, which is www.7, so the word all spelt out, S-E-V-E-N hyphen health.com forward slash 176. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Real Health Radio. So yesterday, an episode of the podcast came out telling you about some changes that have happened at Seven Health and Real Health Radio. Uh, if you didn't listen to that episode yet, uh, I'd suggest checking it out. Uh, it's not a prerequisite for listening to this episode or anything, but it will help things make a little bit more sense if you do. Uh, the cliff notes for that episode are that we have taken on two new practitioners to start seeing clients, uh, and today's guest, uh, Lou Urich, is one of them. So Lou is a certified eating psychology coach, body image mentor, and life coach. She helps women worldwide to grow in self-awareness, find food freedom, and practice body love. Lou graduated with honors from Messiah College and obtained her certification from the Institute of Psychology uh, for psycho- for the psychology of eating. Uh, she is the host of the Untamed podcast and has written for various publications such as Mind Body Green and The Beauty Bean. Uh, when Lou's not changing the world one inspired woman at a time, she enjoys life as anything but usual with her husband and three young kids. She's also an avid reader, tattoo collector, nature lover, Frenchie fanatic, baker, and volunteer. I've known Lou for a number of years now, and so I'm very excited to have her become part of the Seven Health team. And I talk in the intro about this and about what we're going to cover as part of the episode, so I'm not going to do it again here. Uh, But what I do want to mention before I start with the conversation is that Seven Health is now open again to new clients, and this is for working with myself, uh, working with with Lou, who you'll hear from in a moment, and also working with Amanda Bullitt, who is the other practitioner who uh, is also going to be working with Seven Health, and her interview will be coming out next week, so you can hear and learn more about her. So there are a number of areas we are skilled at when working with clients. So one of the biggest is helping women to get their periods back. So recovery from hypothalamic amenorrhea or HA. And this is often a result of under eating and over exercising and is almost always coupled with body dissatisfaction and, and fear of gaining weight. So the work with these kind of clients, is, as it is with, with really all clients, is a mix of understanding physiology and how to support the body, but also being compassionate and understanding psychology and, and uncovering the whys behind clients' behavior and figuring out how to change this. And we also work to help clients uh, who are on the disordered eating and eating disorder spectrum. And sometimes clients wouldn't think to use the term disordered eating to describe themselves, but they see that they're overly restrictive with their eating, uh, fearing certain foods, so bread or carbs or fats or processed foods. Uh, they feel compelled to, to exercise excessively and, and struggle to stop. Um, and or like find themselves feeling out of control around food and, and binging. And with these clients, there are symptoms that are, are common or commonly occurring. So water retention, always cold, uh, poor digestion, uh, peeing all the time, especially at night, uh, no periods or, or really bad PMS symptoms, low energy, poor sleep, uh, low, th- low thyroid, Uh, There's also common mental and emotional symptoms that can go alongside all this. So a compulsion to to exercise, fear of certain foods, uh, anxiety, low mood or depression, poor body image, fear of weight gain, that kind of thing. And with these clients, it's using the same mix of understanding science and compassion to help them recover. And at Seven Health, we believe that full recovery is possible. And I've had many clients who've had multiple stays at inpatient facilities where nothing worked get to a place where they're now fully recovered. 
the final area is helping clients transition out of dieting and learning to listen to their body. So they've had years or, or decades of, of dieting and nothing's worked. So they know it's a failed endeavor, endeavor uh, but they're just struggling to work out what to do instead. So what do they do without dieting? How do they listen to their body? What should they eat? Uh, they're just really confused. And with this work, um, it's often a combination of intuitive eating, uh, a non-diet approach, nutritional understanding, and being able to guide clients toward listening to their their own body. And it's this combination of things that helps them put an end to the dieting habits and, and to truly know how to nourish and look after their body. So it's really these kinds of clients that make up the bulk of the practice and we're very good at helping these clients to get to a place with food and their body and, and even their life that they thought was impossible. So if any of these scenarios sound like you and you'd like help, then please get in contact. You can head over to www.7-health.com forward slash help and there you can read about how we work with clients and apply for a free initial chat. Uh, the address again is www.7-health.com forward slash help and that address will also be included in the show notes. So with that out of the way, let's get on with today's show. Uh, here is my conversation with Lou Yurik. Hey Lou, welcome back to Real Health Radio. Hi Chris, thanks for having me. So look, I am really excited to have you on the show again, uh, but I'm especially excited given the circumstances. So you're going to be joining Seven Health as a new practitioner here, and I, I really couldn't be more thrilled. And look, what I want this episode to be is a way for our listeners to get to know you a bit better, like both about you like personally and your personality, but also just a sense of how you work and how you help clients with the journey they're on. And you first appeared on the show, uh, it was episode 55 back in September 2016, so a bit over three years ago. And I really do want to suggest that everyone go and check out that episode if you haven't listened to it before. Um, for anyone who hasn't, like, do you want to give listeners a bit of background on yourself? So who you are, what you do, what training you've done, that sort of thing? Sure. <laughs> I'm Lou Yurick. I'm a certified eating psychology coach, body image mentor, and life coach. And my training is in eating psychology. And there is a mindful nutrition side of that training as well that I got from the Institute from the Psychology of Eating years ago now about five years ago. <laughs> and that's where my training is from. But I have a lot of lived experience before that. And of course, after that, the best training has been my practice. I opened up my own coaching practice under the name Lou Eats because I am Lou and I'm proud to eat, which is something I couldn't always say about myself also because my last name is the hardest thing to spell or pronounce depending on, you know, if you are hearing it pronounced, you'll never spell it right. And if you see it spelled, you'll never pronounce it right. So Eats was easier. Uh, anyway, but I opened my own practice and have gotten the best and most experience in training. Obviously, you could probably agree on the job, working one-on-one yeah. -on -one with women and just having a diverse range of clients in circumstances and life situations. But some of you listening are probably going to want to know, well, what even got me into this line of work? And I'll just tell you all right now, this was not my plan. I graduated from college with a degree in accounting. I passed my test. I was a certified public accountant. Crunching numbers was my thing. Coaching was never something I even considered back when I was in school, but life has a way of changing things. And uh, as you'll hear in the previous episode, I think Chris, you said it was episode 55. Yeah. I know I shared some of my history then, but I really grew up loving life, my body, food. And when I say loving, I don't mean the dynamic relationship I have with my body and food now, but I didn't hate it. And that's, there's something to be said for that in this world. And, uh, in this time when diet culture and beauty ideals weigh so heavily, especially on, on women and young girls. And so I, and I say, ex especially, but not exclusively 
women and young girls and those who identify as women. But that was, that was my experience was like, Hey, everything's fine here. I was the biggest of all of my friends. I towered over, uh, boys and girls alike most of my life. And that was just what was normal for me. I lived in a family that encouraged us to be active and to be creative and to really get into whatever it was that made us come alive. And so for some of my siblings, that was sports. And um, for others, it was more artsy endeavors. But my parents really didn't pass judgments on our bodies or our activity or the way that we ate. And my grandmother, especially who has since passed, was just so amazing at instilling a love of food and family tradition and pleasure, but also you know, nutrition and nourishment in the way that she cooked and served all of us. Food was a big part of our family life. And so I really grew up at ease, even, you know, going into puberty and high school and then moving to college and getting engaged and married. So many of these like pivotal moments where a lot of women have uh, stress around food in their bodies. I had none having children, um, still none going through pregnancy and the time thereafter postpartum. It really wasn't until, and this is something I know I shared in the previous interview, but it really wasn't until my husband and one of my children were both going through really difficult seasons in their lives in terms of their health. I have a daughter with special needs who has epilepsy and some other medical conditions and developmental delays as a part of a genetic disorder. And then my husband uh, also has a chronic illness. And it was in this time where both of those things were coming to a head that I thought, huh, well, this is a thought, this is something I've realized after the fact, of course, which is true for most people. But for me, I, at the time I couldn't have put to words what was happening, but now in retrospect, given the study I've done and the work that I've done, I know that I was really looking for something I felt that I could control and diet culture sells you the lie that you can control what you eat and what then your body, you know, looks like or how much space you take up in the world and what that space is, you know, chiseled like. And so I decided, Hey, I'm going to do a popular diet and fitness program. And it was one diet and fitness program. It lasted three months. And at the end of it, I did lose weight, but I also lost a lot of life. I lost my period, my libido, my joy, and my sanity around food and around my body. I lost that body image that I once had that was just really neutral, that body neutrality. And um, yeah, I, I lost a lot of things and I developed binge eating disorder and really struggled then for a couple years in something I'd never struggled with before. I made the choice to get a coach that was amazing. And one of the best decisions, if not the best decision I ever made for myself, but also for the people I love around me who, um, thankfully were very encouraging of that choice. And it was after working with her and then diving deep into research. I'm, I love <laughs> researching things. I love biology and learning about how the body works. And that was really something that made me just in all of my body and realize that there was never anything I was going to do to control it or to conform to the beauty ideals that my body wasn't already equipped to stop me from doing if it meant, you know, helping me live and be healthier and to be safe and sustain my energy. And so learning all the things I learned about physiology and dieting and how those things relate to each other and learning what I needed to learn to be an advocate for myself when it came to, um, not having a period and wondering what in the world was going on and not really having any doctors who were able to speak to that because of their own biases. Those were the things that really helped me to heal. And then after that, I thought, Hey, I really, I, I, I couldn't even believe my eyes were open to how many women struggle and how different their struggles all are, but how, you know, there is this thread of commonality between our bodies and what they're designed to do and what they're designed not to do and how they help us to live. And, and it intrigued me so much. I wanted to study it more and I loved the, the change and the transformation of my life so much that I wanted to share it with others. And so I got the certifications I needed and the training I needed and the experience I needed to go out and open my own practice. Well, 
So, look, I would recommend that people, as Lou's made reference to, check out the, the first episode because we go through her story in in much more detail. So what I want to try and do now is just ask questions and, and go through bits that we maybe didn't cover in that in that first episode. So when all of this was going on, how how old were your were your kids at the time? Hmm. I didn't even have all three of them yet. Okay. <laughs> so, um, but my family is built, as you know, Chris, through adoption and birth. So I, we had one adopted daughter and our birth daughter at the time, and they were very young. Uh, I'm right. going to say, I don't know, maybe two or three. Okay. Um, and my son was not here yet. He was a hope in our hearts. We had a- applied to adopt again, but we're waiting so, yeah, that's when everything started coming to a head. Right. And part of the reason I'm asking was just like, did they, did they remember when, when this was all going on with you and, and you were exercising more or they, they were just too young to really be able to put any of that into context? I don't know that they remember, but I do as a mother. And that's something I know you may have experience with your clients, but something that I certainly have experienced my clients sharing with me that they're the way they related to their family and the people around them was so different. And I remember not liking who I was or my lack of patience because I was hungry, you know, um, and underfed and overworked and my just lack of presence also because I was distracted by food rules and what I could and couldn't eat and what I should and shouldn't be doing when it came to exercise. I remember a distance there that my children thankfully probably don't. Um, but, but yeah, I don't think that they would recall it at all. Okay. And with the, the training, um, so was it the eating psychology that you did first? Cause I know you've done that and then you've done some like life coaching as well. So, so what was the order of, of those things? Yeah. You know, um, I did eating psychology first. There's a life coaching aspect to that study as well as a nutrition aspect to that study. But, um, the gist of it was the psychology of eating who we are as eaters. So not what we're eating and how much of it we're eating or how much we're working out and when we're moving our bodies, but more, what are we thinking, feeling, and believing about food in our bodies? Because that is going to dictate really all of it. And so understanding who we are and how we process and see the world and and show up in it is really important to healing food and body relationships. So that's where I started. You know, I, the life coach thing could have happened through practice because as again, you know, working with women around food and body brings up so many other things. Usually food and body issues, struggles, complications don't happen in a vacuum while there can be some, you know, genetic predisposition or, uh, often like trauma can perpetuate some disordered behaviors around food and body. There's just a whole lot of other like life stressors and yeah. simple things that can get in the way and say, uh, and then we go, Oh, Hey, I'll control this sort of like my story. It was, you know, my husband's illness and my child's diagnosis that really sent me going, well, what can I control? And again, that was at a time when I really valued the idea of control and where someone was selling me this lie that I could control those things. And so I did it. And so I see that a lot that uh, life stuff really drives people towards this food and body control and scrutiny because it's something to distract or something to numb or even something to be familiar with. Like we know how to be we know how to be frustrated at ourselves for like eating a donut off plan. And yeah. that, that shame feels really familiar. Whereas the shame, uh, uh, or frustration in our personal relationships or in our job or in our family life or in our living environment might be harder to deal with because it's new and it's unfamiliar and it takes creativity and experimentation and time to process through those hardships. And so we'll kind of just channel it all into something we've been told we can slash should be doing. And that was my experience, but it's also the experience of so many of my clients. So life coaching really came naturally because I realized that's what I was doing a lot is like, Oh, okay. So you, you say you're feeling this way around food at this time. Interesting. Well, what was going on, you know, in your world? Oh, okay. So 
your, you know, colleague at work was really pawning off a lot of things on you and how did you handle, you know, and then we get into this whole idea of like, oh, actually my job's not working for me and I'm numbing out with food or I'm numbing out with restriction. And so the life coaching showed up because it's, it's just a part of the, the coaching experience for me and my one-on-ones for sure. Nice. And, and what was the gap between <laughs> you doing the eating psychology and then you doing that, that life coaching? Um, like if there'd been a longer amount of time, do you think you would have thought, hang on, I just maybe don't need this? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think that I think I needed personally being a hundred percent honest. I, I knew in my own life that obviously in retrospect, I discovered that in my own life, it was the life situations, the, the things happening around me that led to my disordered relationship with food and body that led me to diet and over exercise. And, and we know that one in four dieters is going to develop an eating disorder. So, uh, I knew, I know that now I didn't know that then. And that's all it took for me. First time diet there I went. And, but I still probably would have just kept my own experience maybe like insulated or thought I was the outlier until I started doing the work with women and realized like, wow, there is, there are deeper levels here. Going to the Institute for the Psychology of Eating, understanding and learning that who we are as, as eaters informs the way we eat and the way we view our bodies. And that really affects our day-to-day life was important, but seeing it in practice in the real life examples of, of women coming to me with what was happening with food and what they were feeling about their bodies, but then sharing also the life stuff, the relational job, environmental things that were going on. That's when it all clicked for me. Like, yeah, this is a life thing. This is, this is, there's so much more to it here. And, um, that's where I spend a lot of my time. Yeah. No. And I remember when we were chatting about this, um, during, during one of our conversations, like the, the actual food nutrition piece is such a small component of what you and I work on with, with clients. It's, it's everything else that is really then Mm. having a an impact on that and it's it's true like what i work on and do with clients now in no way resembles what i thought i was going to be doing when i first started studying um Mm. but it's actually the thing that really then makes makes the difference like absolutely i think the the food piece like I don't want to undersell it. I think it can have a really big impact, but it's often a red herring where people are putting so much focus on that without understanding the context, without understanding the bigger picture and how this fits in or the the strings that are being pulled that make you think that this is more important than it, than it really is. So no, I, I would agree that, that that life piece is is so important. Yeah. And listen, when we're in it, when we're there in the food and body struggle, like, no, we're not going, oh, I know that this is happening because of that. I'm telling you, it was a retrospect. Uh, and I'm telling all the listeners that that gave me the wisdom to go, oh, I see what happened there. The yeah. timing of that is is not coincidental. But in the moment, you're like, no, I just wanted to do this diet. Like, I just wanted to, what's the big deal? And it is a big deal. And what happens later, the outcomes that usually lead clients to you and to me, the, the unwanted symptoms of restriction and micromanaging food and negative body image, those things all are, are coming from that one decision that we might not, like you said, have the context for, at least not at first, but yeah. in doing work together and really working through our, our thoughts and feelings and beliefs, we can discover that. And that's great knowing that, well, once I can discover what sort, sort of triggers these thoughts and behaviors, I can look out for it. They can be like my little flashing neon signs to go, Hey, hold on. Let me think about this here. Let me not just do the thing I'm used to doing or that diet culture tells me I should do. Yeah. Um, and I mentioned before about, about kids. So how, how old are your kids now? My kids are 12, 11, and 8. Okay. And so tell me, tell me what they're, they're eating like. What are the kinds of things that they're bringing home from, from, from school or being out in the world in terms of diet culture or comments? And like how, how is all that going for you? Uh, I love watching my kids be eaters. And my husband and I... Uh, we provide food and we usually give a range of options. 
at mealtimes. And then our kids get to pick out of those options what they want. And at that point, there's no judgment. There's no argument. We've kind of laid the foundation and then they get to choose what they're feeling like in that moment. And in that time, I don't have like a, you can only get a snack from the cupboard at this time, or don't open the refrigerator unless it's like 8 a.m., noon, and 5. Like, no. Like, my kids know that they have free reign around food, and we have a range of foods. So we have your, like, processed snacks, and we have fruit, and we have meats and cheeses and eggs and vegetables and a combination of things. Uh, And they do tend to gravitate towards certain things. Each of them have their own interests and desires. But for the most part, they're really free around food. I mean, uh, what, just like a month ago, Halloween happened here in the States. And I am not one of those mothers who takes all the candy away the night after my kids go <laughs> trick or treating for it. It sits in a box, like a giant box. Cause there's three of them and it sits in a box in our cupboard and they get tired of it eventually. And they pick out the things that they want to eat. And there's some things that they don't. And when it's kind of at its place where I'm like, okay, well, no one's, this is just in the way at this point, cause no one's eating from it and no one wants it anymore. We get rid of what our kids have already, you know, showed us by their behavior. They're done with, they're disinterested. And it's as simple as that. There's just nothing to it. There's no fights. Um, it was interesting last night, you know, it's like the holiday season here. So my son wanted to watch home alone one. <laughs> And if anyone's familiar with Home Alone, there's the part where, like, Kevin, the eight-year-old kid, is at home, and he's just like, I made my family disappear. This is great. He, like, raids the fridge, and he's eating uh, Sundays with, like, Cheetos, and he's piling, like, tons of sauces and everything all over, uh, like, chocolate sauce and sprinkles on his ice cream. And my son goes, huh, that probably would feel unhealthy. Like, I bet he – and, I, you know, I'm wondering, like, where he's getting – this conversation, but this, his a mind automatically went to the food and goes, you know, he can't, I don't think he could eat all of that because he probably wouldn't <laughs> feel well. He's like, and my son looks at me and goes, I would probably do something like that if you left, but I would probably just, you know, make myself a small bowl and eat enough bites until I felt okay. Like I felt like I, it was good. And I'm like, Oh, you mean satisfaction? This is great. Like, <laughs> you know, and he's just having this conversation naturally watching home alone and going, Oh, I see that. And that wouldn't make him feel well, but I would really want to enjoy that. So I would probably have this much. That's my thought. Like, and I'm like, Oh yeah, maybe you would no big deal. So we're having conversations like that. And my, you know, 12 year old, she's in middle school. So she definitely sees the dieters and the people who are scrutinizing their food, scrutinizing their bodies. That is not her, uh, packs a lunch every day. And it's just, It's different all the time. Again, we don't micromanage it, so I wouldn't even be able to tell you except for that I do the grocery shopping, so I know it disappears. Um, But I wouldn't be able to tell you what she even eats, but there's no judgment around it. She eats when she's hungry or when the occasion calls for it, a celebration, a holiday, sometime when we're all together and and it's something that we're doing to connect as a family. She might eat for reasons outside of hunger sometimes because that's okay, but she she's generally eating when she's hungry, stopping when she's satisfied. She's really, really smart and in tune with her own body and what she needs. And it's interesting to step back and watch her. She's a competitive hip hop dancer. Her, uh, I'm going to brag a little bit and say (laughs) (laughs) that her team won the world dance championships for one of their routines this year in New York city. So, I mean, when I say competitive hip hop dancer, she's dancing 12 hours a week. At least she's extremely active And she, it's so interesting to watch when she has time off of dance and when she's dancing, what she eats and her appetite changes naturally. And she just goes along with it. She has two dinners, one before and one after practice when she's practicing for four hours in in an evening. But then when she doesn't practice for a couple of weeks, like we just had a holiday break, I watch her appetite just naturally go down and no one says anything about it. And she doesn't even acknowledge it. She just is so good at being in tune with her body that if, as an observer, you can sit back and watch it. So it's really neat to watch my kids have what I would consider a really healthy relationship with, with food at this point. And I can only hope that uh, that continues. Yeah. And they're, they're kind of at an age where a lot of those, you know, 
pickiness or unhealthy relationships could have already started by now. So if you're if you're saying that that's still there with with your twelve year old, I mean that's a really a really good sign. I mean I would imagine if you're training that much. Um, you're going to get some good solid feedback from your body saying like, I'm yeah. really hungry. We, I, I, I need to be fed. And if that can just not be interfered with, that's just like the perfect way to, to be hearing what your body's wanting to say. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and to me, I think that's such an asset, whether she continues dancing competitively or not, she's already had the experience of knowing I can trust my body. It speaks up. It tells me what I need when I listen to it. I have the energy I need, the, you know, the mental awareness that I need to pick up choreography or to do my schoolwork. She's learning all of that just by lived experience now, which is really wonderful. And she is hearing me talking to my clients, speaking about my work. It's something that I love so much. So it's always coming up. I'm telling my family, Hey, I read this article or talking to my husband about something I've discovered or this question somebody asked me and how I'm responding to it. And, and so we're always having conversations about food and body in our house. This is my work. It's what I do and it's what I love. So I'm pretty passionate about it. So it's neat to kind of hear how they're just picking up on that. And then it's, it's creating just beliefs and ideals in their mind that I think are really beautiful. And that I hope, again, I hope that they continue because I'm not in control of what my kids think and believe. And that's the truth. Yeah. And with, with your husband around this topic is a lot of it just like deferring to, to what you think with, um, I don't know, with, with feeding the kids or, or how you're setting things up at home or is he, like pretty involved in terms of he has thoughts around this and this is a, an interest area for him as well. I think he's acquired an interest and it's multifaceted. He and I are both really critical thinkers. We both like to research and understand things. And so if either one of us comes and goes, Hey, look, look listen, what I just like read about or check out this study, or did you know, like, then we're both excited um, now, you know, we're totally nerdy like that. That's the thing that draws us together is we're both like, Ooh, let's think about this together. Let's have this conversation. And, and so I think part of it is just naturally me bringing it up. It, it enticed him to consider those things as well. But then personally, and I know he wouldn't mind me sharing, he grew up in an Italian family as a chubby child who, um, was constantly watching, the relatives around him diet and criticize their bodies while he himself was in a body that was not considered uh, ideal based on, you know, the, the beauty ideals, the body ideals uh, around us. And so he, he internalized a lot of that. Also, the reason I say Italian family is for him and the way that he explains his Italian family, food is love. And there wasn't a moment that people were not shoving food down his, his, throat, whether he wanted it or not, whether he liked it or not. Like if you, if you didn't eat like your aunt Sally's pasta dish, like that, that hurt her heart, regardless of whether you even liked it or whether you were even hungry, you know? And so there was some obligation there around eating, but then there was also this shame and guilt felt by seeing other people around him constantly diet and critique their bodies and, and projecting that on himself that really put him in a place of not being confident in his body for most of his life. And he's, you know, a big six foot three guy. And, um, he just was like, just not, yeah, he, he couldn't, he never found that peace around his body because he always felt like it should be something else based on things people were saying, but then also like food is love. So what do we do? And so he himself had his own experience with dieting and then binging in, and, uh, he lost a ton of weight and, and actually people started coming up being like, Oh my goodness, this chronic illness that he has is really like taking it out of him. Huh? Like, look at him. He looks sick. And it, it was, he was sick, but it was because he was dieting and, and was disordered around food. Uh, that was really what was happening. And he had his own experience. And so coming out of that and us being able to talk, he's, he would probably say he has the best relationship with his body he's ever had. And he's, 37 years old and only in the past, probably five ish years, has he really just accepted like, Oh, I'm going to move my body when and how I want to. 
and I'm going to eat in a way that makes me feel and function my best based on my priorities and my access. And, and I'm going to enjoy my life instead of trying to look the part in order to be able to enjoy my life. So yeah, he is fully on board, but I'm probably more of the geeky one (laughs) when it comes to always bringing it up, always having something new to talk about being like, Hey, listen to what I'm reading in this book or, um, things like that. That's me on this topic, but he's definitely a healthy participant for sure. Right. And so was he going through his, his recovery or I don't know if that's the right label for it, but going through his journey of, of getting to that better place at a similar point that you were, or he saw you get better and that was like, okay, right. I, th- this is something that I can, I can deal with. In, and so now I'm going to have my shot. I would say he was not nearly where I was in ter- in terms of being disordered. He like many men, not all men, obviously we know that eating disorders and disordered eating affects men as well. But, um, he like many men was just like, Oh, I could just do this diet. And then just like, not, I could just do this workout program and then not. And it didn't wreak havoc on his hormones or, and his like mindset and his feelings about self and his body image, the way that it had mine. So it was a very different experience. He, he was like disordered eating light. And I was like (laughs) all the way, you know, like this is a problem. And, and he was so helpful and instrumental and, and encouraging me to get a coach and to get the help I needed to recover for sure. But yeah, it was very different, but he still has that experiential knowledge. Sure. And I know as well, we've talked, um, separately to this on, on other occasions around, I know we've been talking about kids, but I know you, you foster kids and, and are a foster parent. So yeah, talk a little bit about this. Cause I think this is amazing what you do. <laughs> yep. Just, just doing all the things, uh, coaching women around food and body and also being a, an infant foster mom. So my family, we decided together, two of my children came to us through the gift of adoption. Um, and adoption is very complicated And it's not always a gift for many people involved. We think of the birth families. We think of the children who are separated from their birth families. It is complicated. And so um, it's something that I didn't want my children who are adopted to have this unicorns and rainbows view of without also making space for them to see, but also participate in the level of care and love that the seeing the full spectrum of, okay, well, this little infant is coming to us from a birth mother who in one instance really cares about them and, and, but doesn't have the means to provide a home for them. So this is the choice they're making that they feel is best right now. Or, and there's plenty of other scenarios as well, but allowing my children who, who, were adopted and also my daughter who isn't to see like the process of it from multiple sides, I think is really important instead of thinking like, Oh, a stork just dropped you off the end. That's (laughs) never been the way we've explained it to them. Adoption has always been something we talk about freely and openly because there's absolutely no shame in it. But we also talk about it, um, with the understanding that it's not some magical thing that doesn't have victims and doesn't have, uh, pain associated with it as well. And so knowing that and having those conversations with our children as they've, as they've, as they've grown up, we were actually approached, our family was approached and asked if we would be willing to foster newborns from the same agency where we adopted both of our children. And so this was a family decision and we've been doing it for several years now, but, uh, we, yeah, we welcome little babies home right from the hospital and then we love on them, wake up and do the many midnight feedings with them, take them to their appointments and make sure they're getting the medical care. But most importantly, that that touch, that connection, that that human love and nurturing that they need in order to function well and develop well over time in in their future and in their future families. And so we just provide that for a short time for an interim between when they're born and when they are matched with and legally able to be placed in the arms of their adoptive families. 
Yeah, and it's amazing. I mean, I've had a had a call before with Lou where she was holding a must have been couple of day old baby, <laughs> and just yeah, it's it's incredible um, that that you're able to do that, and that you obviously have just that real nurturing side to you. Uh, because I mean, I've I've got a child of my own, but the thought of doing that, I, I don't know how I would be able to cope with doing that. <laughs> It's just, it's honestly, it comes so naturally to us at this point. And it's just a part of my life. I know I already told you, Chris, but sometimes my clients will, I'll be like, Hey, you know, got a little baby here, uh, sitting, sleeping beside me. If you hear a little noise, it might be them. And, you know, and they're like, Oh, cool. Cute. Like some of them are like, can I see it? You know? And, (laughs) and so we have those conversations, but they just, you know, they're newborns. They sleep a lot. And then they eat and poop and that's what they do. And so they just come along with us and whatever we're doing in life. And then we also, though, make, you know, make changes and sacrifices to make sure that they're getting the care that they need. Some of them have special needs when they come to us that need uh, more advanced levels of care in terms of how they're fed or when and, and why they're seeing a pediatrician. And we have a good team here that helps us out with all of that as well. So, yeah, it's just it's something I love to do. I actually don't know. I, like, I don't ever want to stop. Like, I can't even imagine a place or time in my life where I'd be like, oh, sorry, too full, can't foster infants, because it's just something so wonderful to do, not just for the baby, certainly not just for or even mainly for the adoptive family, even though adoptive families are awesome. But also when you think of the birth families and the choices and the sacrifices that they're making and knowing that they ha- that children have a place to go yeah. while they make these really just... Uh, impossible decisions is is something that I love being a part of. Yeah. No, as I said, I think it's it's amazing work that you're doing. So look, I, I want to spend a bit of time just going through some different aspects of the work that we do and get your take on things or how you bring certain things up with clients or how you work on certain aspects with clients. Um, and I know you've got a, a program called MEND that, that you run, and I, I was looking at that as part of getting some, some ideas for things that we could chat about. And, and one of the things that you, you put in as part of that was I discovered that in order for these women to cultivate lasting positive change in their food and body relationship, they needed four things, knowledge, inquiry, experimentation, and support. So I want to just yeah go through each of those and, and what that entails when you're when you're working with clients and and how that is facilitated when you're working with clients. So in terms of the, the knowledge piece, what what is what are you referring to when you when you say knowledge? Sure, and the way it looks in my ten week program is a little different than the way it looks and comes across in my one to one coaching. But the knowledge piece is really just the understanding of not just a uh, the nutrition, like you and I talked about, maybe not even mainly the nutrition side of things, the calories in and out, the macro and micronutrients and all of that, but also understanding how the body works, how the body works under, under the, you know, on dieting, I was going to say famine, but I want to be clear, like it doesn't matter if it's real or perceived, your body will react to the same, whether you are the one like saying, oh no, I'm not going to eat now because like this diet says no, or whether there's actually food scarcity. So understanding what happens to the body in times of not having enough energy input and then excessive energy output, let's say through overexercise or just understanding like what's happening to their hormones or why their libido might feel like it's, you know, gone off and run away forever and what is happening in, in their bodies. But also then I love talking about what's happening in their mind and giving them the understanding around that inner critic voice and that naysayer or the one who's like, Oh, you have to look smaller, eat less, do this, that voice and kind of knowing like what that is and how to respond to it. And then how also to encourage intuition to take center stage in their minds and in their self-talk and what that looks like and feels like. So there's this knowledge component of understanding the way the body works, the way the mind works, the way our feelings and emotions contribute to our behaviors and our ideas around food and body that I think is, is just really useful, but also even getting clear with them of like, okay, well, 
what brought you here? Like what brought you to this place with food and body? And, and let's talk about that. Let's talk about the culture and that environment, but let's also talk about your family environment or the community around you and the things that contributed to these root ideas you have around food and body that have then made their way to the surface and created uh, fruit that that's unwanted. Because most of the time when women come to me to either be in my program or to do one-to-one coaching, it's because there's these unwanted symptoms, behaviors, feelings that keep coming up again and again, and they want to fix that. But the education comes when we talk about the knowledge comes and we go, okay, well, that thing that you're like tired of, that's really exasperating you and that I can totally relate to and understand and um, empathize with you feeling just sick of it. I, I hear you and I see that, but that's actually just the fruit of all these other things over here. And once we can talk about that and I can help my clients to kind of peel back the layers in their own lives and circumstances that are all so unique that's where the knowledge component comes in. So there's the personal knowledge, but then there's also just like the general knowledge that I share. Yeah. And in terms of the the more I don't know, educational knowledge, are there certain resources that you really like where you like, I, I tend to recommend this a lot to people because this just feels like it can be so helpful. Oh, listen, I'm going to, this is embarrassing. No, it's not embarrassing at all. Um, but I'm not just blowing smoke, but I do often refer women to your podcast if they're podcast listeners, because you have such a wide range of experts on. And even in my program, I don't even think you know this, but, um, definitely linked up to both of your podcast episodes about the Minnesota starvation experiment. So I'm sending them and I love talking about that with my clients because it's really great to hear them start thinking critically and be like, Oh, okay. So like, clearly I'm doing this. If they were feeding these guys, whatever it was, 1500 some calories, and I'm advised this on my fitness pal, well, okay, this is making sense. You know? So I love to see those eye-opening experiences in my clients' lives when they're just given information. Certainly uh, the book, Intuitive Eating, I, am I allowed to swear on this podcast? You can swear as much as you like. Okay. Yay. (laughs) Um, but no, the fuck it diet, Caroline Duner. I love her book, um, Virgie Tovar and you have the right to remain fat. There's so many different resources I could list and I'm going to embarrass myself by not listing all of the ones that I feel that I should and naming all of the people that I think I should. But yeah, I love, and I, I say this often, I love being a curator of information and resources for my clients. And then they can go and pick out what works best for them. Cause like if someone never listens to a podcast, they're probably not going to get into, uh, your, some of your episodes, but they might get into an article about the same topic or a book. And so I really go with where my clients want and refer them to those resources, but I'm certainly teaching about, um, intuitive eating as one of the main focuses of the work that I do, but I make it, uh, easier to digest. I'll say I I love the book. The book is so full of information. I recommend it to everyone. And at the same time, I think it can be really hard to digest and put into process for somebody who's right in the thick of dieting, uh, pathological dieting, disordered eating and eating disorders. And so I try to just take it down to like the base level and explain it in, in really common terms and connect in that way to the principles And I also try to make room for those red flags of like, Hey, and this could turn into a diet really quickly. So (laughs) here's, here's the things not to do. Um, or here's the things to be cautious of or be aware of and, and sharing that. So certainly intuitive eating, I am a big proponent of health at every size and practicing movement and, and eating in ways that help you feel and function well no matter your body size for the quality of life, but knowing too the social justice side of that where access and opportunity and oppression play into the way we feel in our bodies, the way our bodies function and operate and what we can do about all of that. So yeah, there's a whole slew of things that I I will share with my clients, but I really base it in my one-to-one, I base it on what's coming up for them in the moment. Because if a client, when they come to me, is most concerned about exercise then that's where we're going to go because one, that's where they're ready to do the work. But two, it's just, it just makes more sense to, to follow the path that they are laying out because 
I want them to know that they can be and are the experts of their own life and their own healing, not somebody else, not a guru, not an influencer, uh, but them. And so leaning into that and saying, hey, we're just going to go where you are because that's the right place to be can be really powerful and empowering, like just in that sense of going, oh, okay, so here is okay, like right where I'm at. Wow. I don't have to bend over backwards or jump to this point or that point in order to pursue my healing. I can start right here. So I'll, when in my one-to-ones, I tend to go where the client has the most uh, energy, where they're yeah. feeling like they most want to do the work in my program. It's laid out pretty systematically. I talk about self-compassion and my client's foundations and future self. So it's kind of like where they've been, where they are and where they want to go in their relationship with food and body. And then we get into intuitive eating and atypical eating experiences. So how are you an intuitive eater around the holidays or, um, when you're going out to eat all the time or at picnics or what's intuitive drinking and what does that look like? We'll have those conversations. Um, then body image, body image practices, talking about intuition and the inner critic. So in my program, it's, I give them knowledge week to week in workbook format. And that's pretty much like if you're in the program, you're getting it in this order. But with my one-to-ones, it, it really depends on where they're at. Yeah, definitely. And I, I would second something you said there, just in terms of intuitive eating. Like I, I tend to recommend the workbook much more than the, than the official book. I find mm-hmm. it a, a, a really great resource. And if someone gets on board with it, then, then fine. I just, yeah, I find it slightly, like for some clients, I just find it a little bit more difficult to get through. And that's why I think things like, uh, like Carol and Duna's The Fuck Your Diet or um, like other books that have come out more recently, which is taking that uh, intuitive eating ideas and, and sort of giving a slightly different spin on it or, or talking about it in a, in a different way sometimes can, can just land better for people. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what I do. I have a whole workbook in my program devoted to it. If you're one of my one-to-one clients and we're talking about it, you get my resources. So, um, I'm happy to share where I redefine some of the principles in my own terms and then kind of expand on them in ways that I think make the most sense for the women that I've worked with historically and seems to be working so far. Nice. And so then the, the second one is the, the inquiry piece. So, so talk about that. Uh, inquiry for me really is just about my clients being willing to ask the questions of themselves. So it's not so much, obviously in our one-to-one coaching sessions, I am asking questions, uh, but I'm doing that with the intention of modeling for my client, what they can do 24 seven on their own to stop and just think about things in a new way. I I've explained it before. Like, uh, when you look at gemologists and they're holding up like little jewels and crystals and they're like turning them in different ways to see how the stone is cut and where the light hits. And if there's any quote unquote imperfections and all of that. And I, tend to encourage my clients to take that approach with their own lived experience where they're holding it up to the light and exploring it in different ways. Okay, well, what if I turned it this way? Well, what if I thought about it like that? Well, what if I looked at it under this light or that one? Or, you know, what if I approached this differently? How how could things change? And so that inquiry piece, I offer a lot of opportunity in my one-to-ones when I'm coaching women to like where I'm bringing up the questions and just, and just thinking through it together with them, allowing them to kind of, uh, just brain dump whatever's (laughs) coming out in their, in their thoughts and in their mind when I'm asking them the questions, but I also will provide them with, Hey, like before our next session, think about this or ask yourself these, these questions or consider uh, the possibility the what ifs around this. And I'm offering them some ideas for how they can continue to practice inquiry when we're not together. In my program, I have, you know, questionnaires and lists of questions for them to ask themselves in just about every one of my lessons. So they get that written out too. But I think being able to ask questions and not just take our first thoughts or someone else's, you know, first initial advice to us or what we see in a newsletter or on Facebook and social media or what we read an article as just like, Oh, yep, this applies to me, (laughs) but really being able to inspect it and being able to 
relax into the idea that we don't have to be certain and know it all. (laughs) And, um, we can be curious instead. So curiosity there is just, it's something that's so healing for most of my clients. Definitely. And I I know you earlier, you said like you and your partner are really great with critical thinking. Like, I think that's an amazing skill to have and and to to teach people and just, I mean, I'm constantly trying to break my beliefs of like, okay, but what happens in this scenario? What happened in that scenario? And just try and like find out, okay, where do things start to break down? Where are their edge cases? Where does this just not make sense anymore? Um, Just because otherwise it's too easy to just make assumptions and get locked into um, fixed ways of seeing the world. And so, yeah, just constantly trying to challenge things because more often than not, the first thoughts that come to mind are are incorrect and they're just yeah. habitual thoughts and they're just what we've been trained to to be thinking. And especially if the, the area we're working with people on is kind of escaping diet culture and escaping thoughts around food and how their body should look and all of those different things, often the first thing that comes to mind isn't pointing towards the fact that it's correct and that's why it's come up it's it's more just a a reflection of okay what you what are you most exposed to or what have you thought of the most um historically throughout your life right yeah so asking those questions and being able to go oh there's like lots of different ways to look at this maybe culture looks at it this one way maybe my family tends to think of it this way maybe i have historically done it this way but what if there was another way to look at it how might i feel if i just you know, which is going to lead us into the next one, right? Experimented with, uh, with living in this other way or taking this different viewpoint or perpetuating these other behaviors. If I just experimented with a new way of thinking and looking at something differently, what might that feel like? Because then you have your lived experience to go on instead of just what everyone says you should or should not do and what you've been exposed to or not. Yeah, definitely. And it's, I mean, I, I really enjoy getting into philosophy and starting to look at all the things that people have wrestled with over time and, and how we used to think about things. I think uh, becoming exposed to that, you, you can see how how much thought has changed. Um, and to, for, for an individual, they can be like, hmm, okay, may, maybe I can see my thoughts changing like that over time. Yeah, I, I'll often explain it to my clients like, hey, do you remember when you used to wear like a uh – like bell bottoms or like wide leg jeans or, you know, whatever the style was, uh, years ago. And then I'll be like, remember that? That was so cool. Like we thought it would never end. And then here we are in the tightest jeans that money can buy. Like that, that's the style now is the skinny jean, quote unquote skinny jean. And, and, um, and like, why did, why do you think that changed? Do you, did your preferences just change or did society dictate, did the fashion industry dictate that your preferences changed and like, how is that happening in other areas of your life? You know, even if you can look at it as something that we all can experience, right? Fashion, um, then even home design and decor, things like that. There's a lot of really basic, simple things that we all experience that we don't place as much judgment around, um, where our preferences and tastes have changed because there's influences outside of us who are dictating that those preferences and tastes change. And if we can see it in certain areas of our life, then it's quite simple to be able to apply that to these other areas of our life where maybe there's more resistance, but at least we can see the possibility there that, huh, maybe everything people are telling me isn't for my own good. Maybe it's to line their pockets. Maybe they are an industry that makes billions of dollars for themselves, not me and not my well-being. What would that look like if I just started being more critical around, um, like m- thinking more critically around the choices I made and why I'm making them? Yeah, definitely. And it's, it's interesting you bring up the fashion one because, I mean, I now live out in the countryside and I'm trying to think how long I've been out here, I don't know, six years, seven years, somewhere along those lines. And it's much more conservative in terms of how everyone dresses so that they're not keeping pace with with the trends the way that it was when I was living in, I don't know, East London. And so when I go back in to to London to visit friends or whatever, like I, I see such a stark difference. Mm-hmm. And there in the last couple of years there's just been a real big shift in terms of where fashion has gone. And I'm very uh just conscious of like, okay, at this stage that particular thing 
I'm just not really on board with. Like it just, it feels so yeah. different to see people in, I don't know, chunky trainers from, from the nineties that I wouldn't have even worn in the nineties. <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm like, I bet you within a short amount of time, my mind will readjust and I'll be like, okay, that just looks pretty normal. And you just, it just is what is, what you're seeing more of becomes the norm. The same way I probably thought about when I was seeing people getting into wearing incredibly tight jeans, which right. hadn't been in fashion for a really long time. And, and then they just became the norm. So yeah, it's just been interesting recently because I've seen such a, such a change and I'm, I'm almost watching it as a spectator because I haven't been participating uh, because of where, where I live and, and just my, my taste and interest in, in fashion is, is way less than it used to be. Yeah. And your experience can inform us all, right? That you aren't participating and the sky did not fall. Yep. You are still living your life and happy with your family and engaging in all of the human experiences that are available to you. And it's fine. you can opt out. And so if we can take that lesson for what it's worth in terms of diet culture and our body image, how wonderful. Yeah. Um, and so what about then the, the experimentation piece and, and you have experimentation and then in brackets, you've got tools and practices. So, so talk about how that looks when working with clients. Right. So, so it really does kind of stem from the inquiry and the asking questions and the thinking critically. And then we go, okay, so like if I've always done it this way because I thought I should, or because that's what I've acquired from the culture or the community around me, what if I approach this a different way? What if there was another way to look at my body or another way to engage with food? Okay, well, let's just try it. So experimentation is really just giving ourselves opportunity to live in ways outside of the ways we've been trained or we've the ways that we've thought were right or healthy or um, good, you know. So so experimenting is just like looking at things a different way, but then actually going out and living the behavior. So I might have a client experiment with, okay, so what if you actually didn't look at the calories burned or the mileage you know, done when you're on a treadmill? What if you just got on the treadmill if and when your body wanted to get on the treadmill and then when you felt like your body had had enough or, you know, maybe we're looking at time because so many of us are so busy and have a lot of time commitments. What if you just stopped? And what if we didn't look at the calories burned or the distance gone? What if you stopped using like quantifiers for exercise? What might that feel like? What might that open up for you? Maybe you realize you actually don't want to be on the treadmill and you want to go to a yoga class instead, or you don't actually want to be inside lifting weights. You want to go for a walk outdoors, but you'll never know that unless you experiment with letting go of doing things the way that you have been and seeing what else is out there. And the same can be said around food or, you know, around the way that we view our body. So like, what if we experimented with saying something kind to ourselves in the mirror, following up, you know, a negative thought or comment? What if we experimented with questioning the judgments we're having about our body and asking where they came from, you know? So I really just have a lot of different tools and opportunities for my clients to go into their lived experience in their very unique and personal life. So I base a lot of it on what we're actually talking about in our sessions and what's really going on for them so that we can make it effective in their life. Because if I just had these like tools that weren't personal, then it's not going to hit home for everyone. But in their real life, we'll experiment with doing things differently. And often it's the things that there's been disorder, judgment, fear, frustration around. And we'll say, hey, what if we okay, now we've looked at it in a different way. So what if we live it out in a different way? Let's come back with some feedback. What, what were those experiences like once you experimented? Okay. Um, how did you feel? What were, what were the thoughts that you were having? What can we do from this? What information did that give to us that we can then apply to the next thing we do? So it's really also learning that like, we don't have to get things quote unquote, right. I'm definitely a practitioner who doesn't even believe, <laughs> uh, I'm a human who doesn't even believe so much in uh, certainty or rightness as much as our lived experience and, and evolving and transforming. And so I'm just opening up that curiosity and that possibility to my clients too and saying, what if there wasn't a right, but there was a good for you right now? 
or a best choice for you right now or the next right thing for you to do, but not right overall, right forever, right in perpetuity. Like we're never going to change. That's impossible. We're humans. We're living, breathing organisms. And so it's really just going, okay, well, what else is there here that I haven't explored? What else could I do? Yeah. And I think the the thing that I take from that is it, it's not even about those individual experiments. It, it's more learning the meta skill of being able to, to pay attention and, and notice how you feel when certain changes are, are made and becoming okay, as you said, with, with uncertainty, but being like just curious and be like, right. hmm, let's try this thing out or let's try that thing out. And, and it not having to be like the, 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 the goal isn't that I get it right this time. It's like that I take something from this that I can learn. So it might be, I do this and I, I discover actually that thing just really doesn't work for me at all. And now I know that information and that's really helpful for me. And, and so, yeah, for, for me, this, component is just part of the bigger picture of just having someone better understand who they are as a as a person and how to kind of explore and navigate the world um, where where like I was listening to a podcast recently and it was a guy called Mo Gaudat I think it's on the uh the How to Fail podcast by Elizabeth mm. Day. And he, it was a really good interview. I'll, I'll put a, a link to it in, in the show notes. And he, he was telling a story about, um, I think his son passed away when he was, when he was 21 and he was then having to kind of deal with, with that whole experience. He, he was someone who was a, a, a multimillionaire who was really depressed and had become on this quest of discovering how to be, how to be happy. And it had really sort of figured things out and his life was much better. And then his, his son passed away at age 21 and he was like, okay, well, this was the point at which I had to really test my, my theories not in a vacuum in in the reality of dealing with this situation but he talked about his son being a a a huge video game player and just monumentally better than than he was at video games and he he was talking to his son and he was like oh do you know how to get through here or do you have how to finish this episode and his son was just like "The, the point of of playing the game isn't to finish it it's to like enjoy playing the game it's to like find all the little different things in here and and how to uh, discover that other thing over there and I just think it's a really good uh, sort of metaphor for this as well of like it's not about like how do I I don't know, hack things and maximize it to the nth degree. It's it's like okay, how do how do I open things up and just do, uh, really enjoy things to 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 its fullest? Yeah, I love that. I, it's a really good analogy. I may or may not be a closeted gamer myself, <laughs> and just beat Zelda, the new Zelda for Nintendo, and I was disappointed. And a friend of mine asked me why, and I'm like, because I didn't know once you beat it, you like couldn't go back in and like like you were just sharing, like explore all the things and like do all the the little discoveries and get all the points and find all the seashells. And this was me being like, Oh, it's done too soon. I (laughs) missed the experience for that, that final objective. And that is so true. And, uh, just so representative of diet culture and, and the, the experience of so many of our clients, isn't it? That they're like going after what they think they're going to get on the other end of eating quote unquote, right. Or having the right body and again, I'm saying that in quotes, but this idea that, that their life is on the other side of eating in a certain way, looking a certain way, being a certain way when really life is happening right now. And we have the potential to miss out on so much if we're not here to embrace it. Yeah. And, and the thing is for most people, they will never get to the place that they, they want to get to with the, the diet yeah. and whatever. But for a lot of clients that I've worked with, they actually have. And then they're just like, huh, mm-hmm. this is, this is not how I thought it was going to turn out. Like there's just a complete right. hollowness to the victory where they're like, but there, like there was meant to be more than this. Like this isn't what I was really after. I was after all of these other things that I thought would happen as a result of it. And, and that can be just so crushing because there's been so much effort put in to, to reach a destination that they never thought or they, they hoped that they would get to and then it just not, not fulfilling um, them in the way that they thought it would. 
Yeah. And I want to say something before we get too far ahead. You and I as practitioners are sitting here talking about, yeah, like experimentation and like doing things a different way and just try it out. And it can sound like to the listener, oh yeah, well, th- they're making it sound really easy, but it's super hard. And so just to, just to say, Chris yeah. and I, I'm sure I'm speaking for you because I already know how you feel, but we both know it's much more it's much easier to say, oh, just experiment and, and go off course and, and like, don't conform. It's easier to say that than it is to do that in lived experience, but it still is so rewarding. And that's where the support piece comes in that, that you, I'm sure we're going to ask me about next in this lineup of like knowledge, inquiry, experimentation, and support, having a coach, having somebody there to support you through it is what's really so helpful a partner, a friend, but certainly if, if there's a practitioner that you trust and hire to walk you through it, because it does feel lonely sometimes. And it is isolating at times to experiment with going against the grain of this diet culture, these beauty ideals, this industry that's everywhere that is telling you the way you should be and what they can supposedly do to help you get there. It's difficult. And we have our own family relationships and experiences personally that play into that as well, not just culturally. And so just hear me when I say, uh, lovely Real Health Radio listeners, that it is, it's not as easy to experiment as we might be making it sound, but it is rewarding and it is so helpful in healing your relationship with food and body. And that's where support comes in because having somebody in your corner to like listen and understand when things are hard and be able to even give you pointers and ideas for how to be compassionate with yourself and even with others around you when things do get difficult, when you're experimenting with new ways of eating and moving and being in your body is such, it's, it's just such an asset. Yeah, and no, look, I, I am going to 100% agree with you and, and echo what you said there. If, if it's sounding like we're making this out to be like a really easy endeavor, like I'm uh, completely understand that it, it is that it is not. And so, yeah, if it, if it sounds slightly flippant and just experiment, like that's that's not how how I see it, and that's just not how it typically pans out for people. And it's in terms of the support piece it's like working on okay cool what what can like where do we start with this what can you do what may feel challenging but you're like you know what i think i can and can do this and that's going to be different for different people they're going to do it at different paces we're going to have to find different ways of being able to approach it because for for one person what feels like the 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 next logical step for someone else is a complete no-go and we have to find some other workaround as part of it so yeah no i'm i'm in complete agreement. i mean is there anything else on the the support side i know you started to touch on it there is there anything else on the support side you want to you want to add definitely what i already said having you know a coach or a practitioner in your corner is great um access opportunity uh you know, finances all play into that. And so that's not something that's, that's accessible to every person all the time, but there are so many online communities that are available. I run one called mend. Um, that's not the same as my program. I run a free Facebook community where I do live training. Sometimes I'll share podcasts or quotes or ideas and answer questions. There's so many other free communities out there for health at every size and body neutrality and acceptance, intuitive eating. There's a lot of spaces to go on social media and a lot of resources that you can get like this podcast where you, you can feel less alone by hearing the same conversations that, that you're having or the same ideas that you're exploring, uh, shared by someone else, shared by professionals and, you know, other people just like you who are going through similar experiences. So the coaching, the community, I think both of those things are really important. I do also talk to my clients about, and this again, like you said, it's different for everyone and it happens in each person's own time. But I do also talk to them about getting, you know, support where they're at, whether it's confiding in a close friend or a partner or a family member, um, somebody who is there like, that they can sit across from and look at and touch and see as in this tangible way that they could trust with how they're feeling and what they're experiencing and that they could ask to, you know, encourage them or just sit with them when they're 
going through something difficult as it relates to food and or body or beyond. And having that personal support is also really important, but there's, there's something out there for everybody. And there, there's at least there's access in one way or another for most people to get some sort of, of support and some sort of help. Yeah. And in terms of the, the, the personal support piece you just touched on there in terms of having someone that you can talk to and touch and feel, and I I get the impression that, that your partner was that for you, but did you have other friends or family that, that really filled that role? And how was it for you when you opened up about your, your own struggles and where you were at? Yeah. Um, this is a, such a good question. <laughs> and if my friends are listening, they're going to be like, I remember that. So I went through this time when, yes, absolutely. Ken, my husband is just amazing. And he was my biggest support through my healing process. And he was the first and only person that I really opened up with at first and was like, Hey, like, this is actually not okay. And I'm super like feeling messed up here. And I need help. And he was the first and only person I told for some time in the interim there. I I had had some food experiences with some friends that were like, I reacted so outrageously to things around food or their questions about why I like wasn't eating or, or like my obsession with, uh, counting and restricting and all of this stuff that I had to go back later and be like, thank you for being who you were and calling this out in me. I kind of sucked as a friend right then. And, um, and I did open up with them as well about what I'd been going through. And that was so helpful to just have people that I could trust around me to be like, Hey, you know, I like, I've been hiding something from you. I've been pretty disordered. And it's so interesting because I had some of my close friends be like, what? I had no idea. Like you were distracted and, and, um, you know, and I'm one of those people who, just to give some context, like no one probably could tell from the outside, like, yes, I lost a handful of pounds, but I stayed within, I hate the BMI scale, but for sake of reference, I stayed within the quote unquote normal range up or down. And so for my doctors, they were like, you're fine. You can't possibly have hypothalamic amenorrhea. Like you're in a normal BMI for my friends. They were like, Oh, maybe your body kind of changed, but not that much. No one could outside, like from the outside could just see, uh, that I was struggling as much as I was and that it was taking up so much of my life. And so that was probably part of what kind of let it fly under the radar for those who weren't living with me day to day, like my husband and didn't see me, um, in some really just outrageous situations with food, but, um, or with my body. Oh, but, but like my friends, they didn't see me crying on my bed being like, I can't run like 13 miles, but I have to, because I ran 12 last week. And I had, you know, like this, these weird obsessions I had with, with doing more and being faster and, and burning more calories and all this. They didn't see any of that. Um, but they did see some like reactions that I had that were kind of volatile and, um, out of character for me that I then had to go and talk to them about. And their response was like, well, you didn't seem detached. Well, you seemed here. And like, you seemed with it and available for our friendship. Cause I was also like apologizing and saying, Hey, like I've been so out of touch and here's why. And I'm trying to get better for myself, but also for you. And they were like, you, it was great. And I'm like, I don't even remember. I don't remember anything that they shared with me, anything that happened in their lives. I know I was like, a, I already told you, I felt not a great mom, crappy friend. Um, I know this in my own perspective because I was so detached and so obsessed, but they didn't know until I told them. But once I told them, they were great supports as well. Nice. And with the the detached piece, was that something you could work out at the time? Because what what I've often noticed with clients is that their current experience is like, okay, I'm missing out a little bit or, um, okay, this is affecting my productivity at work a little bit. But the, the, it's hard for them to really see how much of an impact it really is having until sort of after the fact when things have got better and they're like, oh, my gosh, I just don't understand how I, <laughs> how I was able to survive before. I, I, I kind of – there's a lot of research around sleep deprivation and when you're sleep deprived, you're a really bad 
at guessing how how much it's affecting you. Like you, you, mm-hmm. you, you think, oh, it's okay, my driving's a little worse or whatever, and then you, they do the numbers and it's like, okay, it's significantly worse. And that's often the sense I have when working with clients. It's not always the case, but it's, it's often that in the recovery phase or when they get better, it becomes so glaring to them how much of a deficit they are in and deficit in terms of just so many areas of their life. Yeah, that's my experience with most of my clients as well. And I will say also for myself, in my own experience, it really was, I mean, I knew, I knew there were things that I felt so, I was more easily frustrated. I wanted to control, like once you start controlling one thing, it's kind of like the way you do one thing is the way you do do everything. I, once I started controlling food and my exercise, then you know, it just, I wanted to control a whole bunch of other things as well. And when things felt out of control, I felt afraid and I couldn't have articulated that at the time, but I noticed just this extreme difference in certainly in my connection with my partner and then in the way that I related to my children and just the capacity I had to be patient and loving and understanding when you're not hungry. It's like, so much better. (laughs) Um, so, so that was good. And, and yeah, and even just the way that I related to my friends and could be really, truly present in the conversations we were having or in the moments we were sharing instead of being preoccupied with, Oh my gosh, but can I eat this food that's on the table in front of this really like beautiful friend who's sharing with me what's really happening, you know, in her life and in, in her heart about something, you know, I was distracted by, oh my gosh, am I going to eat that? Why is that person pouring me another glass of wine? I can't have that instead of being present with them. And so, um, I wouldn't have said that I noticed it because I was going through the motions. And I think that's the case for so many of our clients is like, but I'm, I'm still going and hanging out with my friends. I'm just, you know, not eating the food or drinking the drinks. And I'm still, um, going to show up and be a part of that just after I go to my, you know, gym session today, because I can't possibly miss it. You know, so there's this idea that like, but I'm still there, I'm still participating, but you're giving everyone and everything around you, including yourself, like what's left, like your reserve instead of being there and being fully present. And that's only something I realized after I had healed and I was like, Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I think this touches on something else, which is like, finding purpose or or understanding what is really important in life and and how much the the dieting or the over exercising or all the other components just then get in the way of all of that and i've had this happen with with many clients and and i don't know what your experience was like but you you get to a place where you're like i don't even know who i am anymore and i just i'm really struggling because it's like if i don't have this part of my identity or if i don't have this x number of hours being filled up every day by this it's like what what do i do with that time and what and how should i be spending that time because i just don't really know what what is interesting anymore yeah yeah absolutely i you life gets really small in a way that almost feels normal because everyone else's life who's dieting and in a, like really bought in to diet culture and uh fitness sensationalism i'll say is is there they're all there too so it can feel really small but yet you might not notice because suddenly you just become the person at your job who's like really into fitness or who eats really healthy or, and that becomes your identity. And so you have identities in this like really small sphere of food and body, uh, that are hard to let go of certainly as you're healing, but it also distracts you from like, wait, but I don't want to be the person who eats, you know, supposedly quote unquote healthy at the office lunch table. Like I want to be the person who's building my own business or developing this new software or making this difference, uh, when it comes to social justice or, you know, whatever your passions are that you, you lose sight of that, but you're getting something out of the smaller things. You're getting this positive reinforcement for this really small life. That's sort of been built around dieting and, you know, over exercising and all of those things and your identities there that sometimes you can forget for, for a moment, like, Oh yeah, this isn't actually what I see my whole life being like, I don't, um, 
I don't want to get to the end of my life and people remember me as the, as the fit one in the office. I want to have made an impact and okay, so what is that impact and how can we start working towards that today? It looks like, you know, and that's something I work on with my clients too, is we'll, we'll be like, yes, obviously we're addressing food, we're addressing movement, we're addressing body image, but at the same time, let's get into your life. Let's go after the things you want to go after. Cause there's nothing more healing than being like, Oh wait, you mean I don't have to wait on my weight or to, to like fix my food to be just right and perfect and clean or whatever the adjective is of, of the week. I can just actually go start doing this thing and start making an impact or feeling, you know, connected and encouraged and inspired by something right now. And once somebody breaks that seal and starts doing that, it's like, then you realize how small your life had become. Yeah, definitely. And I think, I mean, one of the things I wanted to to chat with you about is like the body acceptance piece and the, the sort of befriending your body again or befriending it for the first time, which I imagine some of what you were talking about there helps in terms of okay, if I can find other things going on in my life, if I can see that my body is not holding me back from, from those things, that that can be healing in of itself. But are, are there other ideas? Are there other things that you'll often do just in the in the realm of, of body acceptance? Well, yeah, sure. I think the first thing is to begin to look at your body like a partner instead of looking at your body like an adversary. So looking at your body like something that you're... I mean, as far as we know, I mean, I don't know what happens when we die, but, um, but as far as we know, like to have this current earthly experience, this human experience that we're having, we're having it in this body. And so what are we going to, what are we going to do about that? Like we, we cannot separate ourselves in this life from this body. So why not just work together? And I will often use the analogy with my clients of like, which I just got a new car, so this doesn't work anymore. But still, I had a blue, and we're talking like periwinkle <laughs> blue minivan for the past several years because I have lots of kids plus foster infants and I need space and I have lovely neighbors that we carpool with. So I was like the blue minivan mom and that was not my vehicle of choice, like not at all. And I really didn't love it but it got me where I needed to go. And so what did I do? I maintained it in a way that showed that I cared about it and I appreciated it. And I didn't have to love everything about it or almost anything about it, but I still took care of it in a way that showed that like we were in this thing together and it was taking me through this life and taking my children and doing the things I needed to do. So I appreciated it with regular inspections and getting the oil changed and car washes and filling it up with gas and making sure that it had the energy to get to where it needed to go. And not like, you know, tearing through a really like hilly terrain or something in it or or beating it up, but taking care of it the best way that I could. And so I'll often use that analogy to just be like, look, I don't, your body can be your periwinkle blue minivan. That's fine. It does not have to be this ideal. You don't have to be in love with everything about it. You don't even have to really like much about it, but can you appreciate it? And if you appreciate it, what are the sort of things that you can do to build that relationship and that connection and keep it, you know, moving you through this life in a way that it feels good and it functions well and you're getting out of your life what you want out of it. So it's just this idea of like, okay, I don't have to like it. And yet we're still in this together, which I think is really powerful. And then something else I think is super powerful when it comes to body acceptance is, and this is going to go back to that, that inquiry and that curiosity piece that you and I have already talked about, but just calling into question some of the things we think about our body. So if we're looking in the mirror and we're like, Oh my goodness, like I can't stand this flab on my arms. Okay. Heard you're human. You're allowed to have these body judgments. It's something I'll never take. I'll never tell my clients like, Oh, just work with me and you'll never have body judgments again, because I don't think that that's realistic. What I will say is you can take those body judgments and question them the same way I'm asking you to question so many things and just be like, well, is there another way to look at my arms? Or is there something neutral I can say about my arms right now? And over time, that really will help to shift. I mean, it changes 
it changes the structure of your brain. If you're following up these negative thoughts that used to go, you know, unmatched or without argument, and you're starting to say something neutral or something kind or look at it in a new perspective. So having just bringing new ideas to the focus around your body is another way to really move forward in body acceptance. And I know Regan Chastain, have you ever had her on the podcast? I have not, but I, I, I know Regan Chastain. She's someone who I, who I need to have on the podcast. Love so, her. Yeah. Um, so I've interviewed her and we've talked a few times. And one of the things she said is with her body and, and she's a woman living, she lives, she's a fat woman who is into fitness and doing all sorts of different, really fun and amazing activities in her body. I still, I believe she still currently holds the Guinness world record for largest woman to complete a marathon. Um, but there was a time when she really felt disconnected from her body and didn't like it. And she shared that over the course of months, just, she made this list and she said it was pages long of all the things that she that were good or she appreciated about her body. And it didn't have to be about the way it looked. It could be like, you breathe today. (laughs) I remember her saying like, she's like, I forget my keys all the time. So if it was up to me to breathe, I'd probably forget. But my body (laughs) did that for me. And so she goes, she tells a story about how she just made this huge extensive list. My body breathes, it grows fingernails, my hair grows, you know, all these simple things and some more detailed than others. And when she would have a negative thought, she would just go to her list and pick something and say that instead. And she said over the course of months, those were the thoughts that came to her mind more often than the negative ones that really changed her perception of her body. And of course, again, she's a woman living in a fat body who is oppressed and judged constantly in our society. And so she's still up against, you know, fat phobia, weight stigma, and all of the things that are associated with being somebody who exists in a larger body. And yet the way she feels about her body is solid and secure at this point, she would say. And now what she feels is the society needs to change instead of her body needing to change. And that was really just a process of changing her thinking and being open to new possibilities of seeing the same thing in a different way. Yeah, definitely. And what you're describing is a, is a lot of the stuff that I also do with clients is, and the way that I think about it is like not liking your your body is a learned behavior. Like you, you didn't right. come into the world uh, like that, it, it's something that that took practice to get there. And the way you, you you practice it was saying things over and over and over again. And even with uh, experiences where someone made a comment about you, or your uncle said this thing at a party, or whatever, like yeah, that was difficult. But what made it such an indelible mark was the fact that you then replayed that five thousand, ten thousand times over the last ten. 10 years. And so it's that repetition piece that if you're just constantly doing something over and over and over again, you just learn how to do it really well. Right. And and so as you're describing with, with Reagan Chastain, if you're starting to to feed different things into your mind to constantly say different things, that's how you start to to think differently. And that's how your beliefs start to change because your beliefs are mostly made up of the things that you constantly repeat to yourself. And so again, I don't want this to sound like a really easy process and you can just go off and do it and it's going to be no trouble at all. Like, yes, it's, it's difficult and this is only like one part of it. And there could be other things that this particular kind of exercise doesn't get you through but it it does help in a in a lot of ways and i do think that the the power of repetition um in whatever direction that's taking you for 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 better places or for worse places um it it works (laughs) like repetition works absolutely yeah and so the other part I wanted to, to talk about was just like the, the social justice component because I know that that's something that's that's kind of a big part of the the work that you do so yeah maybe just talk a little bit about that and and how you bring it into the work that you do with clients if, if that happens with with some clients with all clients well it's happening with all clients and that would really come back to when we're talking about the, what I like to call foundations of like why a client is where they are right now in the way they perceive their body in the way they behave around exercise, around food, those things are, they come from somewhere and we all have our own personal circumstances that those beliefs and behaviors and ideas come from, but we all also are part of this collective, uh, and this culture that feels a certain way 
about certain bodies. And so it always is coming up because what happens is, you know, when a client, let's say, is afraid to eat, oh, I don't know, bread, uh, a client's afraid to eat bread. It's not the bread that's scary. It's what they think is going to happen when they eat the bread, which then if we follow tends to be something like, well, I'm afraid if I eat the bread, like I'll never stop eating bread. Okay. So why is that scary? Well, if I never stop eating bread, I'm going to gain weight. Okay. So why is that scary? Well, because if I'm going to, if I'm going to gain weight, then I might get fat or become fatter and is fatter word more fat. (laughs) Um, I'm not sure, but everyone understands what I'm saying. So anyway, so then, okay. So what's the problem with that? Oh, well then people will find me. And then we get into this idea of oh, people are going to find me unattractive. They're going to think that I'm lazy. They're going to, um, you know, not They're They're going to think that I don't take care of myself. They're going to make judgments about my health or, you know, if that's important to me. So there's all of these things that then follow this idea of like, I'm afraid to eat bread, but actually I'm afraid to be stigmatized for the weight that I carry. And either I'm afraid to continue to be oppressed and stigmatized because I am a fat person living in our culture, or I'm afraid to become that. And so that's the basis of a lot of the behaviors that we have, you know, because we've so, we as a culture have so closely tied health and weight, and we've so closely tied like um, worth and weight that we can't not talk about the social justice aspect of it because it's a part of every person's desire to scrutinize their food and to manipulate their body is to avoid being oppressed and stigmatized or to stop being oppressed and stigmatized if that's what's happening to them. And so of course I'm always talking about it. It always comes up in one way or another because I want my clients to be able to take a second look, to be curious, to be critical thinkers and go, hold on. Why am I the person who needs to change or maintain or prevent or whatever the thing is? Why isn't culture changing? Because there's this diversity of bodies here. And then we can go into the science of body diversity and and just this idea that we're not all like, obviously, we're not all genetically the same or we'd all look, talk, act, be the same. Um, of course, there's environmental influence as well. But in general, like we're different and we're all different. And somebody whose body shape and size you know, someone's body shape and size is generally their body shape and size for the most part, um, regardless of what they do or don't do to affect it over time. Um, we can have short term, what the diet culture would call successes. I would just say short term changes, but, um, but over the course of time, not often are people able to maintain something that isn't natural to their bodies. So of course we're having this conversation and social justice becomes a part of it because we're going, okay, so I feel that I need to change in order to prevent being stigmatized, in order to prevent being oppressed, or I feel that I need to get smaller so that I have more opportunity and access. Like I get that and I so understand where my clients are coming from and why people feel that way, but also it's not their duty to change. It's our culture's job to change. And so I like having those conversations because I don't know that I don't know that you can fully heal without seeing how much the diet industry and patriarchy and just the oppression, even racism plays into our fear of larger bodies. And so it's, it's worth a conversation for sure. And it's something that comes up in one way or another in my one-to-one coaching and also in my program, because it is important to the foundations of why somebody's here in the first place. Uh, hiring me to coach them through their recovery and their healing process. Yeah, definitely. And look, I would I would say the same. It's it's an area that we we end up getting to or going through it at some point because it just it naturally has to come up as as part of that in terms of like, okay, well, what, what are your fears? So where where are those fears coming from? Why do we have these different standards or ideals, or why are certain people more? Uh, respected than than others based on their their body so yeah it definitely comes up in terms of resources what do you is there any that you really like on on that topic or that area I mean I know that's covered a lot in in health at every size and I know definitely you mentioned um, Virgie uh, Tovar before and, and she talks about it a lot in in her writing and in her book um, you have the right to remain fat. Is there other things that you really like on that area or in that area? 
Um, for sure. I already brought Reagan Chastain up. I yep. think she is just she's just so articulate and so excellent at sharing really complicated, you know, like concepts in a very simplified way that connects with a lot of people. She also is the number one resource I send my clients to when it comes to their conversations they're having with their medical professionals, yeah. because she has a lot of really great, uh, ideas for how to approach, how to approach your, your doctor and, and how to respond to your doctor when they're asking you to lose weight or when they're trying to weigh you for like an asthma medication that is not weight dependent, you know, things like that. So being able to have those conversations, she's somebody who gives a lot of great ideas for how to facilitate them and, and based on different, like, okay, well, if you're here, if you feel comfortable doing this, here you go. But if you don't yet feel comfortable, then you can word it like this. So she gives a lot of great ideas for people in larger bodies. I, um, Ivy Felicia is someone else who talks about wellness for all. And, um, she also runs like she has her own Instagram account and other social media accounts for fat black women. So I, what I like to do because at the end of the day, I am a, an, a, you know, tall, thin, dyed blonde haired <laughs> white woman. I have one level of lived experience and it is a lot of privilege. And so I'm always sending my clients to other resources and wanting them to hear directly from people in different size bodies and different lived experiences from different places in the world to be able to get a well-rounded view. Because it's one thing for me to understand and to champion and to convey other women's and other, uh, people's stories to my clients, but it's something different for them from, it's something different for them to hear directly from the source. Yeah. And so I like to send them there. I mean, Virgie is somebody who I just, I love everything she puts out. She's super witty down to earth. I think it connects on a really, in a simplified way, but again, these really complicated concepts, she's so smart. And yet it can feel like you're just friends in a room talking or like you're just reading an email from a buddy when you're reading one of her articles, because the way she says things is so clear and so direct. So those are two people who, uh, I love hearing from the book body respect is also a good one. I mean, there's so many resources out there and, uh, yeah. I mean, if, if you work with me, you'll realize I, I send you a lot of places because again, not everything lands for every person, yeah. but when one, when something really does land and connect with you, it makes all the difference in the world. So I love again, being a curator because there's no shortage of wonderful, wonderful professionals doing great work when it comes to health at every size and body acceptance and cultivating pod positive body image and food freedom. And so why not, uh, get people you know, the resources they really need to help them go further. Nice. And look, one of the things I'm wanting you to help with as part of coming on board is <laughs> putting together a resources list. So this is something I've started and it's just like a half done thing uh, that I need to, to finish off because I want to have somewhere on our on, on the site that has like, okay, if you're, if you're after this, these are all the books that are really great. If you're after this, here are all the podcasts that are really great. Um, cause I know there are a lot of people who already have that. I often send people to, to Jess Baker's site, um, mm -hmm. because she's done a really great curated list, but yeah, I would, I would love to have a, a resources place on, on the site that we can be making reference to and sending people to. Yeah. Um, so look, I'm, I'm conscious of time. And so the, the final thing I just want to ask is like, obviously you, you applied and you're, you're now going to be working with, with seven health and in terms of seeing clients and as a practitioner and, and contributing to the content side of things as well. So I guess what attracted you to, to the position to, to apply? Hmm. Well, you already know some of this, but for your listeners, uh, it's, I mean, it's multifaceted. One, you and I already had a rapport, a friendship long before you were looking to bring somebody on. So I trust you. I love your work. I share your work with my clients regularly. I listen to the podcast and you're somebody that I respect, which, you know, cannot, 
I respect all people, but it can't be said that I'd want to work with all practitioners in this field because I think there's a lot of people who maybe do the marketing really well, but then their coaching isn't all that great or they're not all that uh, wise to the full spectrum of, of moving parts and pieces to healing, helping someone heal their relationship to food and body. And so not all coaches, not all practitioners, not all nutritionists are alike. And you are somebody that I have always respected. And so you, I would say, and working the opportunity to work with you. The other thing that for people who are listening that already know me, you'll know, I don't love the idea of building my own empire. I know for some people that's really exciting as an entrepreneur. They're like, yes, for me, it's been a means to an end. What I love doing is having really great conversations like we're having right now. And uh, so podcasting is great. Interviewing is wonderful. But more than anything, I love coaching women one-to-one and helping them to heal their relationship with food and body on their own terms, where they're really getting in touch they're being compassionate with them themselves. They become more self-aware. I just love watching women evolve in this way that's so empowering and life-changing. And that's what I love to do. So the social media, the building the business, the marketing for me has always been a means to an end. And as you know, Chris, since the beginning of this year, I've been exploring possibilities of what it would look like to just be able to do the end part that I love and that I know I do well without having to do so much of the other stuff. And I've explored a few of those options, uh, but working with you, I think, you know, I'm one of those people who believes, you know, doors open and close for a reason. And for me, I feel like what I went through this year and the decisions that I was making for myself and for my business when it came to coaching and certainly for my clients was leading me here. So it feels like a really good fit because this is what I was after and, um, to feel that it's mutual and to know that you wanted to work with me as well is you know, it's great. It's wonderful. I'm so excited for what's going to come. Yeah. Well, look, I, I am incredibly excited. It was awesome when you, when you applied and, and we got to, to chat again and, and go through this and, and yeah, I mean, when I first thought of advertising for this position, I didn't know how it was going to go. I didn't know who would be a- applying and to, to have you come in like I, I'm just ecstatic and I, I have a huge amount of respect for you also I, I loved your podcast Untamed I've loved following your work I, I love uh, your content I'm on your mailing list uh, your, your emails are great um, and so yeah I'm, I am just so excited to have you come on board and to like if I'm going to be getting someone who's going to be coming to Seven Health to be working with clients I, I want to feel confident that when I'm handing clients off um, or they're just getting in contact to work with with the business, it's like that I want to feel confident that the person who is going to be seeing them knows what they're doing. And I have just complete confidence in in you and your ability and the way that you're able to to work with clients and get the results that they that they want. And again, from, from being able to see this from so many different angles and not get someone to a place where like in six months time they're they're happy but then things start to to fall apart like this is getting someone to a place so that in five years 10 years 30 years they're like I'm so glad I did this like this has really been transformative Um, and that's that's the thing I have I have real confidence that you're able to deliver to people so yeah I'm I'm really Mm -hmm. excited that you're you're coming on board thank you yeah that's what I always say I'm always like uh I want you to never need to hire me again because (laughs) you've become such an expert of your own body and of, of the way food of your relationship with food and your relationship to the world around you that you don't need me. I mean, check in because I love keeping in contact with all my clients. Uh, and, uh, I love hearing, you know, their updates, but yeah, the whole point is I'm really guiding you to learn how to do these things for yourself. Inquiry, experimentation, that curiosity. Yes, I have ideas and I have a ton of professional and personal experience to offer, but at the end of the day, it's teaching you, like we've talked about already, Chris, it's teaching a skill set so that, our clients can take what we've taught and apply it to the ups and downs and all the changes that life has to bring long after we've been working together. Yeah. No, I completely agree. Well, look, this has been, this has been wonderful. It's great having you back on the co- the, the podcast. It's great having you now be part of a seven health and, and the listeners are going to start to hear more from you over the, the coming months and years. Yay. I'm excited. Thank you. Awesome. We'll speak to you soon. 
Awesome. Bye. So that is it for this week's show. As I mentioned at the top, Seven Health is again taking on new clients. Uh, If you're interested in working together or finding out more, you can head over to www.7, so the word all spelled out, S-E-V-E-N hyphen health.com forward slash help. And that's it for this week. Uh, Next week, I'll be back with a new interview. Uh, It'll be an interview with Amanda Bullitt, who is the other practitioner who's going to be starting with Seven Health. Uh, Enjoy your week, and I will catch you then. Thanks for listening to Real Health Radio. If you are interested in more details, you can find them at the Seven Health website. That's www.7.com. S-E-V-E-N hyphen health dot com.